I think in a, in a small way, 18th and 19th century business, business culture was healthier than modern business culture. There's a reason that, um, you know, um, you know, when, when in 19th century fiction, right, when Scrooge is visited by ghosts of Christmas, past, present, future, all of that, the person who's minding his soul is his former business partner, right, who passed away. Like, that's a detail we miss today. Today, we wouldn't write it that way. It would be a past love, uh, you know, like Dante's Beatrice or whatever, or a distant love. Uh, it might be a relative. It wouldn't be your business partner. And I think it's uh, it's very important that people still considered uh, business, you know, a business relationship, you know, in a 17th, 18th century Protestant context, that still means doing God's work, God's work with other people who are in the same community as you are, right? And I think well, we kind of we kind of lost that mildly transcendent perspective of the social technology. And if you try to define business partnerships only by narrow self-interest, I would argue they're too fragile. You uh, you talk a lot about social technology in your writing and many interviews mm -hmm. I've heard you say, which are like the types of technologies or the the things that allow societies to behave. And to your point about business relationships needing to be friendships in the past, there was some limit to how far yes. your relationships could go because you just couldn't meet enough people. A letter could only go as far as you could find people to carry it for you. Uh, you know, your the number of people that you encountered on a given day were always around just based on whatever your geography was. And that's when concepts like the Dunbar number become, you know, deeply important because mm -hmm. you have to have a number of social relationships. There's a limit to the number of social relationships that you can have and the number of people that know who you are, your reputation is uh, far more important in those scenarios. You can't just pick up and leave and, and become transient. And it's something that modern humans probably have a difficult time wrapping their mind around if somebody doesn't point it out to them because it's so ubiquitous in our culture that I could just pick up the phone and call anyone anywhere I wanted as long as I have their number. Well, we have an illusion that we can maintain an infinite number of meaningful relationships. And we mostly maintain this illusion by having very few relationships and maintaining the optionality for many, many of them. However, you know, optionality cannot be consummated. You know, you can't make use of it. You can't grow out of it. Uh, only what is actual, what is actualized, what comes into existence. So I'm going to say, you know, even on my face, you know, on my Facebook account, you know, I like all my Facebook friends, but let's be honest, the term Facebook friend, you know, I feel Twitter follower is a much more honest phrase than Facebook friend. Once you're at 6,000 people, you know, these aren't all your friends. They don't know what's going on. At best, they're people who are like acquaintances, who are somewhat interested in you, who maybe want to see your, you know, a picture of you getting married, or maybe want to read your article or something like this. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that type of social relationship. It's just that, you know, the, um, the full meaning of the social technology of friendship is perhaps one that's eroded over time, right? Uh, there, it's it's like an emotional and a logistical thing, and it was very important for civil society back in the day. Uh, there's one there's a reason that some political theorists refer to republics as communities of friendship. Now, I think that's a different sense and a different meaning of it, uh, but there is there is something to this you know non kin cooperation that you see. Uh, but to say address something that I think you alluded to in the questions like something that's like a little bit um a little bit more broad general important social technologies right when i mentioned religions state formation when i went into this discussion on the nature of friendship these are all social norms that are culture but they're not arbitrary culture they have a mechanical effect right so i think i like the term social technology rather than the term culture because I think in contemporary discourse and thought, we perceive culture as empty flavoring or coloring where it doesn't change anything, but actually it deeply matters, right? It deeply matters what your code of, codes of laws are, what your ethical intuitions are, um, what mechanisms you use to resolve disputes, you know, is your society oriented around market production or gift economies or, you know, command and control economies, all of these things produce very, very different societies. And there's a way in which societies must be a certain way to support certain, certain material technologies. So there is an overlap between material and social technologies. They shape each other. 
over time. Yeah, you know, the your comment about culture being misunderstood in society, I have several times taken Stuart Brand's concept of pace layering and showed it to people. And one of the hangups that I realized people had when I would show it to them is that on the base layer of the pace layering, so basically for anybody that's ever seen this, it's saying what rate do things change? And on it's mm -hmm. just essentially um, imagine um, circles that run outside of each other. So on the top layer, the 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 surface would be fashion and it's going really fast and it goes in all these weird directions right underneath it is commerce then infrastructure then governance then culture then nature and i think most of the time when people are looking at that pace layering and they see culture down there they confuse it for the fashion layer which is yes. the things that make up like what does it feel like to live in this culture what kind of clothes do we wear what kind of uh things are we into what movies are we watching what music is hot right now not understanding that 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 word culture what he's trying to capture there as best as i can tell is what is the mode with which you understand how you are to interoperate with other human beings? And the reason that changes so slowly is if you move and, and each time you go down a layer, the, the layers move slower like a clock or gears. And on the on that base layer of culture, anytime one of those things moves quickly, things have gone horribly wrong. It is not stable. Things don't get produced in the chaotic eras of, of culture change, at least on its face, not, not by default if you make large changes. Yeah, I think um, one of the correct ways to say, think of a period like the Renaissance isn't the discarding of the old, it's the revival rebuilding of the old, right? There's a harmonious evolution that you see from the 13th to the 16th century out of this concept of, you know, man is created in the image of God, you know, man should, you know, be developing all of these virtues, and then a rediscovery, a literal rediscovery of the heritage of antiquity, of Greek texts that were never translated into Latin, suddenly making their way first into Latin, and then, you know, the new languages of Europe, like German and Italian and French and Spanish. And that produces together a revolution of thought um, that we think of today as the Renaissance, right? Sometimes there are fun examples where there are statues literally dug up uh, from the ancient world, like beautiful, realistic marble statues with depictions of like, you know, uh, chiseled into the marble. There's the, the, the image of like, you know, cloth wrinkling and lying on a human arm or a leg. And then they find these statues, they're amazed, they try to make replicas, they kind of fail, they succeed at making replicas, and then they go on and they do their own motifs. And we have beautiful things like, uh, you know, the David or, or so on. Right. Yeah. And, and we as humans also have this weird concept. And you mentioned you uh, this at the beginning, that human progress always happens. We don't realize how much a civilization can be built up that they can learn and have as shared knowledge. But if they don't find a way to pass it on regularly, then that knowledge goes away. So the kind of canonical example being people forgetting how to make concrete for hundreds of years between when they had it in Rome and on into the rest of civilization or how close they got to making the toilet and then having that go away too. And once you lose those technologies, which sounds weird, how could you lose a technology? Then it's just gone and you have to rediscover it in some way. Well, yeah. And especially with regard to Roman concrete, uh, you might, you might know this already, but Roman concrete was made with volcanic ash in a specific mix that allowed it to endure seawater very well. There are still ports in Italy that are, maintain, you know, Roman concrete. If you try to do this with modern concrete and hope that it lasts for 2000 years, you'll be sorely disappointed. The Roman concrete had a minor self-healing property where it would leach minerals through the seawater and so on. And modern concrete, well, it just erodes and crumbles over time. Um, they only recently recreated a recipe that has some of the same formula. But think about that. Not only was, you know, not only did they have concrete, that concrete that was better than ours. Granted, relying on a supply of volcanic ash, sure. But the supply didn't run out. You know, Mount Etna and Vesuvius and all of that, they're still uh, 
they're still doing their thing, you know, as the ruins of Pompeii. Attest. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. <laughs>